I'm Eric Anderson. Tonight on KPBS Evening Edition, there may be a flag on the play. A new report drawing a connection between pro football and paid patriotism. And the events of Charger games that are now under the microscope. Premature birth rates continue to drop in San Diego. I'm Peggy Pico with the March of Dimes report card and a new therapy being tried in San Diego. Then, a free conference to help caregivers, family, and friends of people with Alzheimer's. Where to find local help. We're all trying to play catch up. legal marijuana industry, the growing problem that leaves workers and customers at risk. KPBS Evening Edition starts right now. Good evening. Thanks for joining us. Patriotic displays at sporting events may not be just about honoring the troops. There's a new Senate report out on that practice. It shows the Pentagon paid nearly $7 million for game day patriotic displays. And as KPBS's Steve Walsh explains, most of the money went to NFL teams, including the Chargers. They are a staple of professional sports around the country. Flag presentations and color guard ceremonies paying tribute to men and women in the military. Turns out some teams are actually being paid for those tributes. A new report by two U.S. senators shows just how much money the government spent. The California National Guard paid the Chargers $453,500 in 2013 and 2014. Among the things the report says the Guard received in return was a flag presentation at five home games. The Guard didn't renew its contract this year. After some of the contracts became public in July, the NFL issued a letter discouraging teams from taking money for on-field tributes. They were paid for with recruiting dollars. The San Diego Padres were not among the 10 Major League Baseball teams which received money. Steve Walsh, KBBS News. 16 schools around San Diego County have been dubbed military friendly by a media company that specializes in military publications. Now, they report focused on colleges, trade schools, and universities. The study rated them on their programs to recruit and retain veterans and military spouses. The schools recognized include Cal State San Marcos, Point Loma Nazarene, and UC San Diego. There's a full list online at kpbs.org. A second Republican candidate has stepped up to challenge Democratic Congressman Scott Peters in San Diego's 52nd district. Give it up for Denise Gitsum. She is a local businesswoman, Denise Gitsum, and she says she wants to grow San Diego's innovation economy and build collaboration in Washington, D.C. Whether you're the mayor of a city, president of the United States, the head of the PTA, or the CEO of a startup. Characteristics that make someone a good leader are consistent with all of our shared senses of respect, decency, and common sense. Kitsum owns a public relations firm. She worked for GOP strategist Karl Rove during the 2000 presidential campaign and then in the White House. She's also challenging fellow Republican Jackie Atkinson, who has raised $89,000 for her campaign. So far, Peters has raised more than $1.3 million. Mexico may be another step closer toward legalizing marijuana. That nation's Supreme Court ruled in favor of four people seeking permission to grow plants for personal and recreational use. Now, yesterday's ruling only applies to those four individuals, but supporters say it could help measures being written in the Mexican Congress. Since 2009, it has been legal to carry up to five grams of the plant in Mexico. Legalization of marijuana is expected to be on the California ballot next year. Four states have already made pot legal for recreational use, and the business is booming. But there are questions about worker safety. How are worker protection standards enforced in an industry that's against federal law? A look at the problem from Katie Kuntz of Rocky Mountain PBS. Inside Colorado Green Labs, Frank Conrad is testing strains of cannabis for levels of their active ingredient called THC. And he wants to start testing for pesticides. I think that it's going to have to be come to the forefront as a testing priority. Pesticides are 
known to be toxic to humans. And they know that they're actually appearing in these products in really high levels. For Conrad, pesticide testing isn't just about making revenue. I think it's a public health concern. Denver, the city and county of Denver clearly recognizes it's a public health concern because they've been inspecting and quarantining plants. Since the beginning of the year, the city and county of Denver has placed holds on tens of thousands of cannabis plants all across the city because they found residue of unapproved pesticides to kill things like this. Powdery mildew is a, it's a type of mold that it basically feeds off the plant. It grows fast. It will cover an entire room and then it will basically destroy the value of that crop. That's probably one of the principal uh, agents, I think, that's affecting like the marijuana crop right now. The pesticide best known for killing off powdery mildew is called Eagle 20. Eagle 20 was one of the first pesticides identified by Denver. Miclobutanol, which is the active ingredient in Eagle 20, is known to be low toxicity if humans ingest it. Inhaling it, though, is if it's burned and generating hydrogen cyanide, that's an entirely different problem. Hydrogen cyanide is a toxic gas most notorious for its use in Nazi concentration camps during World War II. And it's produced when Eagle 20 is burned, which poses a pretty serious threat for consumers. The popular pesticide is also commonly mixed with a solvent that can pose a threat to workers inhaling those fumes. And yet, there's a lot of money in protecting these crops. Millions of dollars, in fact. When viewed nationally, hundreds of millions. Three states now allow the sale of marijuana for adult recreational use. And for the tens of thousands of workers in the industry, more than 20,000 in Colorado alone, these pesticides could cause lasting illnesses. Workers should have um, protective equipment so that they're not constantly getting exposed to it. Part of this is a ventilation issue. On inside, you're actually accumulating the fumes and the workers are getting exposed to them. Short-term exposure to it, you can get ill, but your body will recover. Long-term chronic exposure is associated with a number of different health risks, but particularly neurodegeneration. That, I think, is one of the clearest risks to uh, workers if they are not wearing protective equipment while applying pesticides to marijuana. But cannabis is still federally illegal, meaning that the feds have not yet provided any resources or guidance to ensuring worker protection, which means it's up to the states. In Colorado, ensuring worker safety is up to him, Michael Rajarasi. Currently, I think our um, inspectors have reached probably about 100 facilities. But there are more than 1,000 licensed cultivators in the state. The issue is that without the resources of the federal government, it's difficult for a state-level agency to have the resources to effectively bring in regulation in a timely manner. They're doing what they can. They're chipping away at the problem. but. There is always going to be agricultural pathogens and there will be a need for pesticides potentially to treat them. The EPA says they're willing to work with the states, but the process takes a long time. Meanwhile, complaints just keep coming in, revealing hazardous use of pesticides and dangerous environments for employees. But the rules are there, it's just a matter of following them. There are continually changing sets of rules. We're also looking at the worker protection standard changing within the next six months. Overexposure to pesticides can make people sick, leading to missed days of work and school. It's going to be a lot of seminars and meetings to get people aware of the new changes. We're all trying to play catch up to an actual agricultural industry. Pat Curra is a cannabis grower and he hopes that these trainings will bring legitimacy to the industry. Now that we can follow the same regulations as, say, corn farmers, uh, Palisade farmers, we can start to be looked at as an actual industry and not something that's, you know, swept under the rug. Let's not talk about it. Let's actually be here and be a part of the, a part of the agriculture industry. But without swift and consistent enforcement, thousands of workers in Colorado and across the nation are at risk of harmful exposure to toxic chemicals. For Harvest Public Media, I'm Katie Wilcox. Katie's story came to us through a collaboration with Harvest Public Media. It's made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. West Nile virus cases are on the rise in San Diego. County health officials reporting another human case today. That brings the number to 31. The number of birds infected is also up. It is the highest number of San Diego cases of the virus in seven years. Officials say hundreds of people have tested positive statewide. 28 have died because of the virus. 
Eating for two may be leading pregnant women to put on too much weight. The Centers for Disease Control says nearly half of U.S. moms gain too much during pregnancy. The CDC report finds that can be bad for both mom and baby. Officials point to health problems and potential complications in labor and delivery. Preemies are some of the tiniest babies born. The infants can be small enough to fit in the palm of an adult's hand. There's a new report out that shows that the premature birth rate here in San Diego is actually going down. And as Peggy Pico explains, there's more that can still be done. Babies born at least three weeks before their due date are preterm or premature. Early births are the single biggest cause of newborn deaths and the leading cause of cerebral palsy. The annual March of Dimes National Report Card released today finds San Diego has one of the lowest rates of premature births in the 100 largest cities in the U.S. Joining me with a look at the report and what's being done to decrease preterm births are my guests, Vicki Lombardo with the March of Dimes and Dr. Anoop Katheria. Director of Sharp Mary Birch Neonatal Research Institute. And Vicki, San Diego's rate of premature birth from your report I found is 8.3% of all live births. That puts us in the top 10 best cities for having the least amount of preterm births. Um, but the city still got a B. How come we got a B instead of an A? Because the goal for the March of Dimes is to reach an 8.1 level and you're more than one standard deviation from that 8.1. So you like California have a B. And Chula Vista actually was separated out and they had a 9.1 rate, which was also a B. So what's the situation in Chula Vista? Chula Vista uh, has probably, my guess would be that they have an access to care issue and the moms just don't know what to do. The March of Dimes is doing a lot of education with clinics and doctors to help them teach moms what to do to be healthy. According to your findings, what are the racial and age disparities when it comes to early births? Across the country, the, the biggest risk is in our African-American moms. They have the highest rate, followed closely by our Native American moms. In the state of California, though, it's our Asian moms that have the lowest preterm birth rate. So the lowest preterm in the Asian population, higher in uh, Native American and African Americans. Yes. Um, Doctor, do we know some of the reasons why these disparities are? Uh, is, is it genetic? Do we know what's, what's causing the differences? The, the truth is we don't have a clear answer. I think it's going to be multiple causes. You highlighted genetics, and I think the other one are, is access, access to care. I think many of these families don't get care early enough to be able to treat their pregnancies and allow their babies to go to full term. And uh, Dr. Katheria, uh, what are the survival rates and, and the biggest medical concerns for babies that are born too early? Well, the survival rates get worse the more premature the baby is. So currently we have the technology to take care of babies born up to four months early. And those survival rates are poor. They're less than 50%. And not only do when they survive, the risk of cerebral palsy and other neural problems are much higher. But the closer you get to term, the less um, long-term problems and the survival rates are much higher. Overall, the survival rates for most premature babies are in the 80s to 90 percent. I also understand that you've been doing some innovative treatments for yeah. premature babies. One of them involves keeping the babies connected to their mothers at birth. Tell me about that. Yeah, well, while it's innovative, it's really quite simple. When a baby's born, rather than rushing to do something, you're really doing nothing. You're letting that baby stay connected to the mother and then providing assistance for breathing and et cetera technologies. I think the biggest thing that we've sort of moved away from is the whole idea of rushing to provide assistance for babies, whisking the babies off to other rooms where the parents have no idea what's going on with their child, fearing the worst. So, so I just want to say that to be clear, when you say connected, you're saying you're leaving the umbilical cord attached to the mother's placenta. Yes. So what, we, what we're doing is after the baby's born, we're leaving the baby then connected to the mother with the placenta still inside the mother. And we have a little bed that comes up next to the mother that allows the baby to receive breathing assistance while at the same time getting this extra blood. And one of the things I always like to highlight is is that preterm babies are very different than full-term babies. If you're born before 30 weeks, you leave 50% of the blood behind if you cut the cord right away. And that's blood that's not just blood, but it has stem cells, immune fighting cells, a lot of cells that help these babies protect their brain, help blood go to their organs, and sort of promote long-term development in these babies. And Vicki, what are some of the reasons we've been talking about the premature babies, but our rate has been dropping here in San Diego. What are some of the reasons behind that? Some of the reasons are just the education of the physicians and nurses about not being too anxious to electively deliver babies before 39 weeks gestation. Uh, papers and studies have come out showing the significant brain development that happens as well as the risk for complications if we get just too impatient and we deliver too soon. So I, just waiting 
makes a big difference. I see Dr. Katheria uh, nodding his head. So I guess my, my last question to you that we have to end on is, what is the best way? Is there one singular way to uh, decrease premature births here? No. We don't have a single best way. I think it's going to be comprehensive care and looking at some of the new things that the March of Dimes is doing to help promote pregnancy longer and, and look at maternal factors. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, you can read the entire March of Dimes report uh, on our website, kpbs.org. Dr. Anub Katheria and Vicky Lombardo, thank you so much. Thank you. San Diego is hosting a huge visitor today. The Chinese Navy's hospital ship, Peace Ark, docked at the Broadway Pier downtown. The vessel towers over the pier. A huge red cross stands out against the hospital ship's white hull. This is a military craft, but it stands ready to help in case of humanitarian crises. Commanding officer Sun Tao said the ship will spend five days in San Diego in its first ever visit to the U.S. mainland. Tao says the ship is in San Diego to share information with the crew of the USNS Mercy, the U.S. Navy's hospital ship based here. The commander says it's good to share training ideas as a way to deepen understanding and friendship. The Peace Ark has visited Hawaii several times, but public access there was limited. The San Diego stop features public tours and even checkups for Chinese nationals living in the United States. Now says the ship has more than 100 doctors and nurses on board. There are beds for 300 patients. It has all the trappings of a modern hospital, but there is also room for more. Tao says people from different countries have their own way to defeat diseases. Traditional Chinese medicine has a long history and is very important. He says it doesn't matter if the crew uses Western medicine or traditional medicine. He says if it works, they use it. The Peace Ark has sailed more than 130,000 nautical miles and visited 25 countries. The owner of the San Diego Union Tribune and the Los Angeles Times could add two more Southern California newspapers to its portfolio. Tribune Publishing is offering a $3 million loan to Freedom Communications, the bankrupt owner of the Orange County Register and the Riverside Press Enterprise. Tribune says it wants a meaningful seat at the table when the papers go up for sale. There is a $3 million bill left unpaid by the State Board of Education. Board members say they won't pay a test contractor because the company was late in reporting test scores for the Common Core curriculum. Educational, educational Testing Service oversaw the online tests for 3 million students last spring. The company was late in providing results for districts who needed to mail out student reports to parents. It was also late in completing test results for districts. Board members say that held up the release of statewide results for the Department of Education. While the testing contractor met a lot of the components of the contract, uh, one of the components that uh, the board um, wants to make sure that we uh, address is the lateness in scores for school districts and for parents. So um, the opportunity is to be good fiscal stewards with this taxpayer money and withhold $3 million. The Board of Education has a contract to use the same test giver for the next three years. A toxic algae bloom has closed California's crab season. The State Fish and Game Commission voting today to delay Dungeness crab season and close the rock crab fishery for most of California. This comes just days after warnings of dangerous levels of a neurotoxin found in algae off the West Coast. The toxin has hit shellfish and sickened or killed seabirds. It can cause severe reactions in humans. The delay could affect stores and restaurants across the country and could even affect some people's holiday meals. This is the first week of open enrollment for California's health insurance exchange. Some new data show that about 2 million people are eligible for coverage, either through Covered California or Medi-Cal, but they haven't enrolled. Industry analysts say immigration status could be an issue. They estimate 40% of the state's uninsured are in the country illegally. There are at least 60,000 people in San Diego with Alzheimer's or some form of dementia, and experts say a diagnosis is life-changing, not only for patients, but also for family members. Peggy Pico talks about caregiver challenges and local resources. 
Alzheimer's is the most common type of dementia in the U.S. In San Diego County, the majority of people with the disease are cared for at home. To help caregivers, families, and friends, a free conference will be held in San Diego this Saturday. Joining me with the details is Mary Ball, president and CEO of San Diego's Alzheimer's Association. And Mary, uh, Alzheimer's is the most common type of dementia, I understand, in the U.S. What are some of the warning signs? Well, for warning signs for warning signs for Alzheimer's disease can be confusion with time and place. Someone who's always been prompt their whole life and now they're late for things and they're missing appointments. Changes in hygiene. Um, people who have memory loss oftentimes forget when they wore those clothes last, when they showered last. Um, you know, losing things. Uh, you know, those are all a lot of warning signs out there. And, you know, the, the biggest concern around the warning signs is a lot of times family members rationalize why they may be forgetting those kinds of things. And they really need to take those warning signs and seriously. That leads me to the next step. When is it time to go to see if you have a diagnosis? When is it time to take someone in to get checked? If, if you're having concerns about a loved one, I think it is very important to go see their primary care to doc doctor, explain um, the challenges that are happening, and start asking questions and seeking, is there some kind of a diagnosis? Um, what may be causing the memory loss? How is Alzheimer's diagnosed? Typically, Alzheimer's di is diagnosed through different kinds of memory assessments. It could involve an MRI to measure different areas of the brain, um, but typically family members are very aware um, that the person is having memory loss, and it's much more of a confirmation from the medical doctor. I see. Now, San Diego's Alzheimer's Project says about four out of five people with the disease are cared for at home. That's a lot. What are some of the key issues that caregivers face when taking care of a loved one with Alzheimer's? Well, it's so challenging, and it's a it's a 24-hour-a-day job for caregivers. So everything from making sure that person is safe and they don't wander, because statistically, six out of 10 people will wander. So it is so important for people to take some measures to make sure their loved one is safe. For caregivers, it can be very isolating because you're caring for that person. They may not want to do the things that they've done previously because they're difficult to do. So as a caregiver, how do you stay connected with your friends, your neighbors, but continue to care for your loved one at home? So it's, it's very challenging. And we, we hope that caregivers will reach out to the Alzheimer's Association because that's our mission to support people. Well, speaking of which, what are some of the local resources here in San Diego? Well, just through the Alzheimer's Association, we provide a number of classes, close to 40 support groups throughout San Diego County. And that can be so helpful for a caregiver to be talking to people who are on the same path and they can get tips and ideas that might work for their loved one. We have a, a volunteer companion program where we train volunteers and match them with families and that volunteer will provide needed respite for the caregiver. So oftentimes they'll come in four to six hours a week so that caregiver can have doctor's appointments for themselves, um, get some time alone so they can recharge. Well, as you know, November is Alzheimer's Awareness Month, and your association is putting on a free three-hour conference, so not a super long one, for caregivers, families, and friends. What are some of the key topics? Well, we've got Dr. Michael Plopper speaking from Sharp Mesa Vista. He is a real expert in Alzheimer's disease, the different medications out there, um, how to get a diagnosis. So it's a wonderful opportunity for people to be able to ask the doc questions about their situation. Dr. Dr. Dara Schwartz is speaking, and she is a really an expert in how to manage difficult behaviors because it can be very challenging with the person who's suffering from dementia and how do you get through the day um, managing some of the things that are happening with them. And then, of course, Amy Abrams, who is the Education Director with the Alzheimer's Association, is going to be talking about a lot of the local resources out there. Well, a good opportunity, Mary Ball. Thank you so much. And I want to let folks know that the Understanding Dementia and Changes in Behavior free conference is from 1 to 4 p.m. this Saturday at the Sharp Healthcare Auditorium in Kearney Mesa. Registration begins at noon. We've got more information at kpbs.org.
I'm Gwen Eiffel on the next news hour, an inside look at rebuilding America's nuclear weapons. That's Thursday on the PBS News Hour. Little Miss India America is the story of a woman who competes with a beauty queen to keep her boyfriend. And that's the comedy that is kicking off the San Diego Asian Film Festival. It starts tonight at the Museum of Contemporary Art. The 10-day festival will screen some 130 films from 20 countries. A list of films and the schedule are online. We posted a link at kpbs.org. Get ready to tee off at the ballpark this weekend. Instead of nine innings, San Diegans will get nine holes at Petco Park. They call it the Lynx at Petco Park. Golfers will start at home plate, and they'll work their way around the upper decks, taking aim at holes that are down on the field. Now, they finish on the roof of the Western Metal Supply Building. Golfers who are lucky enough to sink a hole in one will get a brand new Callaway driver. More brisk autumn weather on tap in the forecast with a possible warm-up for the weekend. Look for temperatures in the 70s by the coast overnights in the 50s. Uh, if you're looking up into the inland valley areas, temperatures there are also in the 70s. And uh, in the mountains, it's going to be even cooler. Highs only reaching in the 50s and 60s. Out in the deserts, temperatures in the 70s and 80s. Overnight lows there in the low 50s and uh, upper 40s. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thank you for joining us. We'll be back here tomorrow night. Have yourself a great evening.